Uh, good morning, world. Maria here, alive and kicking. Welcome to the show. Today I have a special guest, and we're not going to talk about politics. We're going to talk about something totally useful for yourself. I want to tell you a little bit about him. His name is Gary Stewart. He is a he works with Constellation Healing Institute. He's internationally recognized when he explores invisible family dynamics as a constellation facility. Hi, this is Maria Heller. Years. If you're enjoying so this show, please consider listening I to the rest of it along with universe, hundreds of other hours of education by a small subscription on so my site. Totally Get over to maria.net, totally M-E-R-I-A.net. And I found you it to are the be only thing effective, that supports we'll this show. There's the show no corporate on. control I and there's plenty of education on site. So please consider either a subscription or a donation to keep the work going. There are too many alternative voices that. out there that are so being silenced because of lack of support. White list so if you don't site. want MSM uh, to be the only mind controlling uh, news out there, with the please that consider be. supporting anyway, the people let me say that good support morning you to my Gary Stewart. and uh, good morning, help us Gary. all save yeah. something Hello, for the morning. future for our children. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm so excited about the show. Uh, You talk about being a transgenerational constellation facilitator. That's a whole. Yes, yes. That's a whole lot of big words. Can you? Okay, I can. I can reduce it down to a soundbite, hopefully. (laughs) Well, for me, it was you know something brand new, so I really didn't understand. But you've taken so much time and patience with me that I have a pretty good handle on it. Yes. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, generally, uh, it was discovered about 40 years ago, or it was really a synthesis of a lot of progressive thinkers. Uh, Bert Hellinger coined the term, and it just really stuck. So if we look at a picture of our family system, we all know what that picture looks like. But constellations look at the deeper picture, the kind of multidimensional emotional structure of the family system that's kind of unseen. So if we look at our family, and I never dispute people's belief about their family. That's the belief that that's the reactions they had, but there's really something deeper. There's a deeper flow of love that lets us suffer generation after generation with something that's unresolved and unseen. The great thing about constellations is we use a representative to even be your dead grandmother that you never met, and you're seeing you inherited her grief pattern, her post-traumatic stress pattern, because an accident happened in her life. And science has already proven that post-traumatic stress can be an inherited. That means you can have the reaction to post-traumatic stress without having been in the action that created it. So like an example for me, my father, you know, killed lots of Nazis in World War II. Our family, who was born after the war was over, carry elements of post-traumatic stress from him being almost killed daily by Nazis while he was in uh, Europe. And many other tragedies and traumas have befallen many people, and we don't even connect that we're reacting to a place and time that no longer exists. Mm-hmm. So the consolation process lets us really go back in time in a way, kind of back to the future, like the movie Back to the Future, and change an element of that or get a broader vision of what's unseen that we're reacting to in our current life, which actually isn't ours. That's the kicker. It's not ours, yet we're reacting to it. So consolations create a healthy boundary uh, between the past and the present for the best future possible. Well, that's very well explained. Uh, when you, uh, yeah, I love the way you describe our life as a movie in your book. Yes, absolutely. And And I, do we want, oh, go ahead. ahead. And I don't think most people think about that, you know, and I can tell you this, my ex-husband used to get mad at me because everything that happened in our life, I used to compare to a movie and he used to say, life isn't a movie. And I used to say to him, if it's not a movie, then it's a song. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And I wrote the book because it's a very hard modality to explain. People think it's about astrology or this or that. It's not. The the term constellation stuck because if you look at a picture in the stars, they say it's the Big Dipper, a bear, a dragon, a snake, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever whatever you see in the heavens. Well, our family system is those people moving moving and living uh, like a breathing organism, so to speak. And it really, there's a picture beneath a picture beneath a picture. And so constellation Constellations go to the deeper movement uh, and the life force of the entire family system throughout the many generations it existed. Mm-hmm. 
Now, I know that you also uh, host a show called Consciousness Connection on Blog Talk. Yes, yeah, Conscious Connection, yes, yeah. And I, and I have innovative thought leaders like you, authors, and interview people that are trying to further our understanding of our place and time here on this crazy planet right now. I know, but I had a thought the other night. I said, oh, I have to remember to ask Gary. Uh, do you consider, and I don't even know if you, if you give credibility to past lives, do you consider past lives as part of our ancestry too? Yes, absolutely. They bleed through. I'm the first person who developed a past life constellation. So we set up a representative to be whatever past life that needs healing or resolution. Uh, what I find by doing that experiment, so to speak, that is pretty valid, is that a re so a representative, so even let's say a client's working, um, even if they're not present, I do distance work from all over the world, they will pick a representative to be them resolving this issue, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the rep starts saying what the deeper issues, so we're focusing on, say, drug use or addiction, and the deeper issue shows up, there's tremendous grief from a, a dead uncle that happened two generations before that person was born. And um, I had one family, a Mexican family came, uh, one of their uh, son, well, the parents were there. So it was a Mexican family of about, I think, seven or eight people. The whole family came as an intervention without the person who was uh, doing lots of drugs and drinking. Mm -hmm. And we set a rep up to be him. And what showed up is he was carrying the grief of his mother's twin brother that was killed in a bar fight in Mexico 20 years before he was born. Wow. The mother was there crying and crying and crying. All his siblings are. Now, he, he wasn't there. We used a rep for him because he was so inebriated he couldn't be present. Mm -hmm. The next day, he stopped drinking and doing drugs. That's because fabulous. He was carrying the grief that the mother carried as an 18-year-old girl having her brother, twin brother die, a deeper connection where they were twins, and he was a dead ringer for his dead uncle. So his mother saw him as her brother who died, and he kind of on a soul level agreed to carry that grief for her because she couldn't handle it for her whole life. So the family was absolutely amazed. How could this happen without him being there? And we saw what he was carrying. So the more the mother could grieve and finally let go of her brother who was killed, unfortunately, in a bar fight, uh, she completed her grief there. Therefore, he didn't have to carry the numb it with substances because it was too much for him to handle. Right, right. Well, that's fabulous. You know, it kind of reminds me of, uh, you know, carrying family secrets. And it's interesting because yeah. I love John Bradshaw's work. Me and too. He got me interested in this line of thinking way back when. Right. And one of, you know, one of the books of his that I recommend the most is Family Secrets. And I said, Absolutely. wow. I said, Gary took Family Secrets to a whole new level. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's great because I prefer group experiences. I can do one-on-one. -on -one. But in a group experience, we get to track the trauma way back uh, in, before we were born. One client said, this isn't my family. I said, you, didn't, you weren't even born yet when this was happening. This is what you birthed into, you incarnated into this nightmare, so right. nightmare on Elm Street. You know? <laughs> well, speak of nightmare on Elm Street. In your book, you have a list of you know if you had to describe your title, your life as a movie, and yes. you gave us a bunch of suggestions to pick from. Yeah, and I picked Rocky. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That's so fitting and that's so wonderful. And you are such a winner and a champion and a truth seeker. I just admire you so much. Oh, thank you so much. It's just like sometimes I question, you know, because I remember in Rocky, he says, it's not how many times they knock you down that counts. It's how many times you get back up. Exactly. And exactly. I'm like, oh, my God. You know, in the 17 years of doing this show, Gary, Mm -hmm. I have seen so many people come and go, come and go, come and go. They thought what I did was easy. Uh, yeah, and I yeah. would say, well, why don't you try it? You know what I mean? Give right. it a shot. Let's see how long you last. And if, right, they were, exactly. right, if they were doing one show a week, they were exhausted. And I was at mm -hmm. that time four and five shows a week, which still happens sometimes because the time is yeah, fantastic. Demanded. Yeah, and just your content is so good because it's a no BS. 
And God forbid there's some truth out there now about so many different things. We're of the same mindset. I just watch and observe all the lies out there. Mm -hmm. And that, that brings me back to consolations. A lot what we find with consolations is life is kind of a perpetrator victim loop mm -hmm. in many cases. And we go into that loop. We didn't design that loop. We're all partaking in the wheel of life. And it almost seems like violence and destruction move life forward. It's an odd concept, but we see it over and over again. And I, I deal with a lot of sex abuse victims, and it's almost like every perpetrator, and that's some of the worst stuff we see in American society outside of politics. Right. And uh, they, every perpetrator was victimized first, and they try to get away from that sense of powerlessness by being a perpetrator. So we hold both um, to bring oneness consciousness to it. We hold both perpetrator and victim equally, and our goal as consolation facilitators are using this process is to neutralize that bond so it can remain in the past and not be carried and acted out in the future by both sides. Right. But I'm more concerned, of course, with the client who seeks help from me, and we're not trying to heal their perpetrator because we use a rep for those dark people mm -hmm. in their life so they can have closure and say the things they never could say while they were victimized. Absolutely. And, well, you know, even if you followed Bradshaw's work, you know, especially yeah. he did so much on, you know, abuse, victims of abuse, and how he taught that somebody somewhere down the line has to break that pattern. Right. And most people, I, the co courageous people that I work can, and I have the courage to add the perpetrator element. Whether I'm working with Jewish people, I would always add the SS if they had Holocaust. Uh, a few Jewish men approached me last year. They couldn't sleep their whole life. They're in their 60s. They have insomnia from the day they were born. We set up the prison. Well, we didn't set up it. We set up their mother, whoever was in the prison camp, in the Nazi guard that made them have the post-traumatic stress that they could be dragged away in the night. And, you know, they were pretty beclent watching it. And we got to a resolution between the fate and destiny of the SS and the Jewish victim. Mm -hmm. And obviously they didn't get killed because their child is here working in the room 80 years later 60 years later right you know <clears throat> so after that they could sleep the post-traumatic stress belonged to the parent or grandparent who was in the camp they were reacting as though the nazis were outside their bedroom door uh, almost a century later so it's quite magical that we can go back in time almost like reenact in a way but our goal is to tune in the deeper spiritual energy of that crisis perpetrator victim bond that happens through trauma and release that bond so it can stay in the past and the client can be fully present. Right. Well, I'm sure there's a lot of people saying, well, you know, how can that possibly work? But if you think about it, they do tell us that we can genetically inherit our parents' disease. Absolutely. And I do a lot. I do a lot of health work and stuff like that. And disease has a tipping point before it really takes over the body. There's a chance we can change it. And I think we're supporting the immune system. And I've done distance work with people with different diseases and odd things showed up. Um, a very good friend of mine who was one of the Oscar winning sound, he got an Oscar for doing um, uh, I'm trying to remember, I'll think of the movie in a minute. But anyway, his, his great niece was stricken with uh, hemophilia, horrible hemophilia. I mean, it's called Von Hillebrand's hemophilia. If you touch somebody, they can hemorrhage and die. I mean, a finger pressure, five wow. grams of pressure. So he said, well, can you do something? I said, I'd love to. You've done me lots of favors. And, uh, <clears throat> and I said, yeah. So we set it up. And the rep for her, now mind you, she's in Phoenix. And she's a, a minor, but, you know, the, the, her mother gave permission to do this distance work. She didn't even know what it was. And what showed up is her rep was looking at the floor uh, to her left and right. And she said, there's two things missing, one on the left, one on the right. So I had little heart pillows because I really felt she was an in utero triplet. And the minute I put the hearts down there, she collapsed on the floor and said, now we're all together again. That's what I've been missing. So what is the connection between in utero triplets that might have uh, receded into the bloodstream of the mother? They shared blood together. They're like blood brothers or blood sisters in utero. Now, this is an ancient memory. No one's going to conscious re consciously remember their fertilization. Right. But that's what showed up for her. So I called the mother the next day. She said, you're not going to believe this. I didn't write this down on the intake sheet. But since she was one, years old, one year old, she wanted a little stroller 
so she could put her twins in there so the three of them could be together. That was her earliest. So on a soul level, she knew right. that. And it showed up in the conversation without her writing that down. It showed up for us. And um, the, the good thing is she was on RH clotting factor like once a week. She's down to one or two times a year now. Now, I don't know if because she was approaching puberty, the hormonal imbalance. Right. Leveled off or something with estrogen or whatever, but she's in a much better place and she's so out of danger now and she's forever grateful and it's just wonderful to help somebody. Now, mind you, she was not in the room and her physical DNA of her clotting factor changed by doing one or two constellations on her hemophilia. That's fabulous. You know, well, as, yeah. a, as a Reiki master, I mean, I send long distance healings to people yeah. all the time. Mm-hmm. And I will get, you know, feedback from them. They felt it. They felt better. You know, they knew when it was happening, which is kind of weird because I don't have like a set time for that. It could be 11 at night. It could be midnight. It could be whenever I get in bed. Exactly. Well, what I tell people is consciousness is everywhere. It's not physical. So it's not bound by the speed of light or time or space. It's really eternal. Consciousness is eternal. And us forward thinkers like this who know that, we can use that to our advantage. And especially when it's about increasing love, compassion, the good stuff on earth, that we all came here rather than the dramas that are playing out insanely right in front of us every day. I know, I know. And I have to, I have to unfortunately cover most of that. But I, I know, I know. <laughs> it's good because there's no voice of truth out there. That's what saddens me the most. It's like anything that could be considered the truth is you know, a manufactured soundbite that they want you to avoid the truth. I just watch in amazement that people can be so suckered, myself. I know. But that's, that society is in a perpetrator loop right now. I mean, I see our country as a perpetrator nation, actually, against its people and out in the world. And, you know, if we look, <clears throat> if we take the consul- consolation precepts to that, I often wonder if America is the richest, sickest nation on earth because the soul of our nation knows we're doing damage globally and we're almost suffering physically because of the violence that we do around the world to keep oil companies rich or resource rich or whatever. And I'm wondering if part of the soul of America is so diseased and sick because of what we do around the world that people don't think there's a reaction. But, you know, every nation has a soul as much as a person has a soul. And we would we would suffer to balance out the karma of what we're doing. And I just wonder if we stop, you know, raping and pillaging the planet, if Americans' health would change instantly. That's a, we're that's, supporting life rather right. than destroying life. Right. For profit, no mm-hmm. less. <laughs> well, you know, I've been saying this for so many decades that it's, it's, it's probably boring my listeners already. But I, mm-hmm. I've always said a nation founded by genocide can only end the same way. Exactly. I totally agree. And with the forced vaccinations coming and everything, it's like going to get pretty hairy pretty fast, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. And I have, to t- I have to tell you this, I mean, in case everybody's listening and thinking we're a, a mutual admiration society, the way, mm-hmm. I, way Gary and I got connected was it was my daughter who started working with you. Mm-hmm. And Gia had called me and she says, Mom, you've got to meet Gary. You two are like soul twins, she said. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> and then the rest, as you they say, was history. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's just truth needs to be out there. So what we find in constellations, the family's been hiding a truth, like John Bradshaw's secrets. There's been some simple truth. Great grandma was a lesbian. She didn't like that. You know, whatever the truth was. What I tell people is like, we were strong enough to live through the negative, so healing it should be actually a breeze. Letting it go should be a breeze. The the negative to that is some people are so afraid to let go of the old reality because they don't know what the new reality is going to be like without the pain. Right. So pain becomes a comfort zone that they will well, wait, wait, what will my family say? What will, you know, what will it be if I'm the first happy one and I come from a depressive family? They're not going to, I'm not going to fit in anymore so there's that fear that you won't belong that actually 
makes people do pretty crazy things within a family because they feel they belong to that crazy family, and if they right. happen to be sane, they'll be rejected or excluded. Right. They say, well, I'd, right. I'd better stay crazy or take Prozac right. so I can be part of the family, which is doubly crazy. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, you know, you know my family history uh, quite well because yes. you and I have worked together, and yeah, and, absolutely. and you've you've worked with my children. You did a phenomenal, phenomenal mm-hmm. work for my son. He's so grateful. I can't even tell you. I'm, oh, it's as an his, honor and pleasure. And as his mm-hmm. mother, believe me, I'm even more grateful. Yeah. But, you know, when I was four years old, uh, you know, I was hit by a truck, knocked unconscious. Nobody knows how long. But mm-hmm. one thing I do remember is when I came back or came in, right. and I was conscious and, and seeing where we were living, how we were living, the crazy Italian family that I was in, I, mm-hmm. I remember to this day thinking to myself, who are these people? Where mm-hmm. are my Jewish parents? And how mm-hmm. do I get out of here? Right, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I mean, that was as clear as the bell. And I mean, most people don't remember anything from when they're Absolutely. you know younger than five or Absolutely. six. Absolutely. Well, maybe there was a blessing with that uh, accident that it knocked sense into you. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. you <laughs> sense of the insanity ever since. <laughs> right, although a lot of my friends say, okay, you literally were hit by a truck, so that's a good excuse for you. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, you have a great quote in the beginning of the book. And mm-hmm. believe me, working with you and reading your book, uh, has got me talking to ancestors that I don't even know. I just call them out all day long, as a matter of fact. You, mm-hmm. you start with, we are our ancestors' dreams come true. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Because, you know, the same things we want is what they wanted. But say a Jewish family in Berlin, they didn't expect Nazis to be walking down the street or, you know what I mean, or anyone uh, the trauma befell them, and they all wanted a good life to have children, to go on to be prosperous, but life got in the way. A tornado got in the way. A Nazi regime got in the way. A famine got in the way for our Irish listeners. Mm-hmm. And it created all kinds of drama and trauma. And what happens is it kind of gets frozen or, or stuck in the family system, so they start to react that trauma and never stop. So it kind of becomes a comfort zone that we all have to suffer like this, generation after generation they don't forget that suffering right. and uh, they're even doing scientific experiments um, they had a small village in Norway there's a YouTube video on it uh, small village in Norway everyone's lived in the same 50 mile radius for like 200 years what they found was when there was a famine in the great grandparents generation the great grandchildren got diabetes and science is trying to figure out why would a famine affect the pancreas two generations later mm. And it's so interesting how a reaction to something that happened by your forebears will create a disease in the descendants. It's beyond fascinating, you know. And you look at all the depression in the world right now. You know, what is that post-World War II? Uh, is that, you know, from a miscarried baby that was never honored or a father who never, you know, who died at war and they never got to say goodbye. So I find many simple things like that. Having a rep saying goodbye to someone who died, that they didn't have closure. You know, they mm-hmm. died and they were buried. And um, that just having that goodbye, uh, being able to say that to a rep or have the mother rep say that to her father mm-hmm. and the client is the granddaughter who doesn't know any of this, she wasn't even born, Boom, all of a sudden, the client feels healed, their lives change, and then the mother isn't even told about the consolation. And they said, my mother's totally different. And I said, I tell people, don't tell your parents or whoever's repped that they were in a consolation. Just watch what happens in them. And so many people, so many people have mentioned sexual abuse in their childhoods after we did a consolation for their daughter who was. And it's like the truth starts to bubble to the surface. People aren't afraid of the truth. And they were never told that that was the subject of the consolation. So the reaction is happening in your entire family system without them present and evolving their soul consciousness around the trauma issue without them even knowing that their grandson or granddaughter was working to better their life. 
Right. Well, everybody benefits, whether they know about it or they don't. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And that shows you the totality of consciousness that we all share. I really look at it that we're one human family. We all have grief. We all have loss. The details may be different, but we're really one species with one set of feelings. Sadness, grief, loss, joy, hope, desperation, Hi. you know, perpetrator, victim. It's all part of this mix, like a Van Gogh painting, you know? Hi. I should say Salvador Dali. All like Dali, <laughs> huh, for sure. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, when I went after I worked with you, and, and I must tell my listeners, this is very deep and involved work. I mean, you, mm-hmm. you, you got to put in some time to get through this. Uh, you know, when I saw your questionnaire, I was like, wow, this is going to be like homework. But I love shit yeah, like yeah. that. So I'm like, yay. Uh, and I probably sent you more information than you even needed. Oh, no, it's very good. It's very good. <laughs> oh, mm-hmm. But after that, when I started reading your book, you know, there are very few authors that I, ha- that I have ever read. And because of how long I've done my show, being an avid book reader my whole life, right. I've mm-hmm. read, uh, God knows, thousands and thousands of books. Out of all of them, there are only a handful of, of authors that make me stop while I'm reading and think. Mm-hmm. Oh, excellent. That, you know, that's the biggest compliment I could have. Thank you so much. Right. I mean, the other one was, you know, John Bradshaw. And this man that I have on my show every other every other month, Michael Reikia, whose spiritual work, you can't just rush through it. It's so beautiful and so perfect, but it also makes you stop and think. Yeah, which is good. I mean, that's why any book worth reading, it should make you ponder different things because you're growing as you read it. I, I put my heart and soul in it so that the reader can say, oh, I've never thought about things that way. A very good friend of mine who's known me for 30 years, she said, I had to put it down and say, I'm waiting until my vacation so I can really digest this. You give us some deep places. Right. And it's like, why not? Right. you got to <laughs> go deep. shallow lives. Exactly. You know? Well, as I started reading your book, I ended up ordering a copy and sending it to my oldest sister, uh, mm-hmm. which is something I've done with Bradshaw's work with her because uh, we both remember things quite it's quite the same but very different. We'll call it that yeah, way. I know. Uh, but there's so much in the book that helped me help you because I was mm-hmm. having realizations while I was reading the book. Absolutely. And, th- and that's my intent. I just look at it that it comes from my heart and spirit to add more love to the world. And I feel my mission this lifetime is to add more love and compassion to the world. And as I write, I have that in mind that I want the reader to open up to new levels. And uh, this field of consciousness is opening up deeper levels in me. And I just want to share those gifts that I get from doing the work with the reader or the client who's in the room actually doing the work or not in the room with distance work right well you know and don't uh, don't discount I, that mission that gotten, oh, i'm sorry they, no, that's okay i'm sorry too yeah. it's, it's too bad we can't see each other so we know when to shut up and uh you know a deep insight is that as children we're taught to betray ourselves to get our needs met from the parents, like, you know, the parents who don't do this, they're trying to protect you, but at the same time, they're limiting your growth under their rules, so to speak. And I just, you know, the deeper place I get to is that we as children, oh my God, I can't be who I want to be. I can't do what I want to do. And that's the protective side of parents, but on a soul level, they're, if they were squashed by the grandparents, then they're going to squash their children like they were squashed. And so no one gets to fully bloom unless they really break through the pavement. And that's that level of betrayal, mostly with our mothers, because they're our closest confidant, because we swam inside her for nine months. So we want to honor that bond more than anything, and we'll take on more suffering for the mother, more than the father in a lot of cases, because we were inside this woman. We know her. Everything that was unresolved in the mother, that's why when we resolve something now, it's actually going to help our mother because we're inside her. So if we resolve it on the outside, it's, that energy is going to go and heal the mother, whether she's living or dead. Exactly. And then, you know, I have had quite a few conversations with her, my grandmother, people beyond mm-hmm. her. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good thing I live alone or people would think that I was insane, I'm sure. 
But you uh, said something very interesting about yourself, uh, Gary, that I wanted yeah, to comment The other on. point of the book was to empower people. Do you want to live in your parents' sequel, mm. or do you want to take charge of your life and direct and create the movie you want to live in? So you can have a blockbuster movie if that's what you, maybe you're lower keen, you just want a nice, you know, easy melodrama, or, you know, you just, everyone aspires to have it's a wonderful life, you know, with uh, Jim Jimmy Stewart way back when the Christmas, alleged Christmas movie and people don't realize that movie was actually political guys does a guys does a christmas story right against the big banks and the pigs that still were on yeah, this country exactly right. and Waterville and all that and at the end that wasn't a christmas bell that was the liberty bell <laughs> <laughs> they wanted liberty people to take financial liberty and not buy into the whole system you know it was, it was really wonderfully done i and know that, and it was even, a sleeper movie it would they didn't even want to make it and yet it became know, like exactly, a classic it was it, it's art has a great way of uh sneaking through the cracks and that's what i want to do with this book to get people to see the surface is non-threatening and then they go deep 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 as they read it so it's uh well it's amazing it's just it's a great book you know and i wanted to comment on something you said about yourself because it's Mm -hmm. really important you kind of just mentioned it as a matter of fact Mm -hmm. you said that you're here to share love to bring love you want to do what you do with love Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, a lot of my clients, everybody's looking for what's my sole mission. And they all think they're supposed to lead a revolution. And a lot of them are artists, musicians, and some of them are just beautiful souls. And their whole purpose is to show that beauty, share that beauty, share that love. I said, what is more important than love and joy on a planet Mm -hmm. filled with so much ugliness? I think it's the highest mission you could possibly have. Absolutely, absolutely. And if an artist loves their art, then you do your art to your heart's content because that the people will see the love in that picture and that will inspire love in them and they will buy your work, you know what I mean? And absolutely. hopefully you won't have to die to make money at it, you know? So <laughs> yeah. it, it's the, and I think every family wanted that. I think they just get so stunted and twisted from the traumas that they're incapable. You know, a lot of people judge drinking and stuff and and I don't because Sure, we work on people with substance abuse, but let's say my father killing Nazis all day, and he had some whiskey in Germany and a cigarette. Do you think after he's been shot at or just killed another human being, him sitting having a moment of peace with a cigarette and a whiskey, that was massage, that was acupuncture, that was psychotherapy? Mm -hmm. Most generations did not have the zillions of modalities out there to support us and heal us that our ancestors had. So that whiskey and that cigarette meant a lot to those soldiers who just risked their life for either freedom of the country or to be against Hitler or whatever the case may be. So, you know, when that grief and loss and pain turns into alcoholism because they can't live with what they did, of course, then it becomes substance abuse. But that's all they had back then with tremendous adversity. So I have compassion that our soldiering ancestors or anyone that that was their own only therapy available was let me get away from this pain life is too much pain i gotta get away let me just have a drink and forget this pain that's how a lot of substance abuse started so what we find in current you know at addictions and stuff like that it's that inherited pain they're still trying to get away from that's actually not theirs that's a very good point, and that's very yeah, well so one said. One thing I did is I viewed all the Nazi boys my father killed. He had a, he had a kill for me. He was on Omaha Beach, which he said his whole life, the beach, the beach, the beach. And then I never know, what the hell is this guy talking about? We like to go to the beach. Why is he always talking about a beach? And when I saw Saving Private Ryan, I said, uh, oh, my God, the opening scene on the beach. I, uh, I staggered out of the theater. I said, that's the beach that he never stopped talking about. I was I was absolutely stunned because. I was I too. My father's psychology made total sense to me. And he was a very violent man. He died at 46 of a horrible cancer that ate him alive. And I think he had so much survivor guilt uh, from that, you know, leaving seven children behind. And, you know, my 30 something mother. I mean, it was just not a pretty. And that's the winning side. Right. That's and that, the, right. That exactly. That's the winning side. 
exactly. Well, in some ways, the Nazi boys got off easy. All right, at least they got uh, to go so home. I, I carry those Nazis. He killed his fallen brothers in my family. The Hellinger, and Bert Hellinger, the developer of it, he said there's kind of orders to love and things that are kind of constant. And he finds anyone who is perpetrated against another, that victim or perpetrator belongs to the family system through the violence or abuse. Wow. So that means my father, basically the people he killed, became part of our family system as missing men. And it actually showed up in many constellations. Uh, someone didn't even know my father was dead. And he said, I'm standing here with all dead bodies at my feet. And I had tremendous compassion uh, for his being able to stand in life and being able, and like an alpha male, I have to kill to stay alive. This is my fate in World War II. Mm. And so it gave me tremendous compassion for his uh, foibles, and he was a very violent man and suffered greatly with disease. And I said, wow, look what he carried to stay alive, and yet he still wanted to give life. And right. I want to give a shout out to women who have experienced sexual abuse because it blows my mind that these young girls were actually stronger than the perpetrator on the soul level, that they could withstand that atrocity at any age, you know, five, six, seven, eight, whatever it was, 10, and yet they still chose to become mothers. That blows my mind more than anything. It shows you the power of sexuality, that it will obliterate any belief or negative experience with the drive to procreate and be a mother and hope it will be a better day, hope that they can protect their child from what the danger that they experienced. Mm -hmm. And just the, the courage of that is just, um, you know, mind blower to me to perpetuate the species at all costs. Right. Well, Gary, that's well said too. And wow, I could visualize what you were saying about your dad uh, yeah. while you were saying it. We're going to go to a short break. We'll be back. Stay with us. Gary and I will be right back. Hi, this is Maria Heller. If you're enjoying this show, please consider listening to the rest of it along with hundreds of other hours of education by a small subscription on my site. Get over to maria.net, M-E-R-I-A dot net. You are the only thing that supports this show. There's no corporate control and there's plenty of education on site. So please consider either a subscription or a donation to keep the work going. There are too many alternative voices out there that are being silenced because of lack of support. So if you don't want MSM to be the only mind-controlling uh, news out there, please consider supporting the people that support you and uh, help us all save something for the future for our children. Thank you so much.